Let's talk to Dr. Rowan Williams, a former Archbishop of Canterbury and currently the Master of Magdalen College in Cambridge. As a life peer in the House of Lords, he's written today about the findings of this cross-party report. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, these are horrifying attacks, aren't they? They really are. And I think one of the problems is that it's it's only recently that the, the violence in what are called the Middle Belt states of Nigeria has come into focus in the way that Boko Haram has in the last couple of years, because one of the things that's happening in those Middle Belt states in central Nigeria is the exporting of a Boko Haram and indeed uh, Daesh ISIS influenced ideology from the northeastern states into the Middle Belt so that historic conflicts there between different groups are being as it were ideologized they're turning into religious conflicts tell me more about what we mentioned there in the introduction the specific threats aimed at christians uh, very directly talked about by these militants what are the sorts of stories that you're hearing i'm hearing a lot of stories about massacres in villages about horrific gratuitously brutal killings and sometimes um, people being threatened with death if they won't convert. And this is part of a longer story in the central states of Nigeria, where there's a long-standing conflict, as in so many parts of the world, between pastoralists, nomadic herders, and settled farmers. In this area, most of the pastoralists tend to be Muslim, most of the settled farmers tend to be Christian. As grazing lands for the pastoralists are affected by desertification, the effects of global warming further north, they're moving further south, they're exerting pressure on the farming communities, and because those are largely Christian, they are very much in the firing line. But in the last few years, very definitely, those um, largely Muslim groups pushing southwards have picked up a lot of the ideology of Boko Haram so that these conflicts become much more nakedly about Muslim versus Christian. And yes, we hear these stories about attackers shouting Allahu Akbar and using the, the language of threat, the language of um, cleansing that they take from Boko Haram and the um, ISIS affiliates. And in terms of the consequences, uh, we mentioned there the amount of attacks. Uh, you were talking about villages that have been raised. Are Christians being driven out or are they staying and having to actually just navigate somehow those sorts of horrifying risks? At the moment, a safe guess of the number of displaced persons in the region is about 300,000. So a lot of them are, in fact, fleeing. Um, some, some choose to stay. Some are under pressure to engage in, in counter violence. There have been some stories about that, but its effects have been relatively small compared with the very large numbers of Christians who've been killed by um, Muslim militants, Islamist militants, I should say, because very often its fellow Muslims were also the victims of Islamist militants. Now, we've had this Westminster report. I mentioned at the start of the introduction, the UN also condemning these attacks. In terms of the international dimension, what could be done to offer more protection, do you think? There are a number of things which I think the international community can, can press on the Nigerian federal government and also things that can be done in terms of international conventions. One of the things that's driving this conflict is the availability of arms, especially small arms, quite a lot leaking out from the Libyan conflict, interestingly enough. And there are a number of very, very wealthy cattle barons in the region who are quite prepared to arm some of these militias at considerable expense so that there's a lot of up-to-the-minute equipment going on. So it would be very good to have some, some focus on the arms trade and the enforcement of existing restrictions, especially on small arms. Second thing is the um, programs that have been worked out in recent years by the Nigerian federal government to do with a sort of equitable resolution of conflicts about land and grazing land. Um, there's a, a national program of um, agricultural and livestock transformation that needs to be implemented more, more fully and more fairly. That's something which can be pressed. And then there's the question of education for nomadic herder groups, yep. which has slightly slipped off the radar recently. So all those things, I think, are subjects that the international community can bring some pressure to bear about. Well, we shall see if uh, that transpires in the weeks ahead. Dr. Rowan Williams, thank you very much for taking time to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you.